be still, so I hope that doesn't uh, distract anyone too much. Uh, I'm an autistic adult, my name is Krista Holman, and I am really thrilled to be having the opportunity to share this information with you today. Generally, what I find with the medical language is that it tends to remove everything that is good, human, and even beautiful within the autistic experience. So, depending on the source, and I could not nail down a good number for this fact, but I've seen estimates that 20 to 30% of autistic people have limited to no verbal speech. But I want to add that this doesn't mean that they can't communicate, okay? That's really important because sometimes they just need to be given the opportunity. And people assume they can't, and that's, that's horrible. However, it is a myth that autistic people cannot be articulate. I stand out. I have been standing out my entire life, and nothing makes me more miserable than trying to blend in. Let's go back to that term special interest because that one gets me. That's why I threw these air quotes in there, okay? I think passion, you know, as I said earlier, passion is a much better term, but you know, we see that a lot when describing autism as this pathological language. I'm passionate about autism, the workplace, office culture. When a non-autistic person has an area of expertise, it's not pathologized. It really does make me sad when I, when I hear autistic passion described using pathologizing language, obsessed fixated, repetitive behaviors. Autistic passion, it's where innovation happens, okay? Before my diagnosis, it was as if everyone around me knew all the rules, social rules mostly, but I didn't. Someone forgot to tell me these rules, but I was constantly still expected to know them. I found the answers to a lot of my questions, primarily searching three hashtags on the internet. And all everything you know, started with Twitter. Twitter. There's a lot of autistic people on Twitter. A lot. It's weird. Like, you never think, oh, where are all the autistic people? Well, they're on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Three hashtags. Actually autistic, that's the main one. And just for those of you who are not autistic, go read through there. Don't tweet using that tweet, because the tweet means you are an autistic person tweeting. So don't use it, but please read it. Brilliant stuff in there. Great, you know, I encourage everyone to, to read anything you find that are actually autistic um, because you'll learn a lot. The other one, I saw that there was a problem because of what I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you don't want non-autistic people using that actual autistic tag because that's like our bat signal. Okay, that's how we find each other on the internet like the Google search and all that. It doesn't prioritize autistic voices. It prioritizes big news outlets, medical sites, and big organizations. So I created Asking Autistics because there was a really big issue where we had allies out there who wanted to engage with the community and they had questions and they couldn't use the actually autistic so that's where we have Asking Autistics. And that hashtag's been around for I think over two years now, and that's a really great tag. If you're an autistic person or not, but use the Aut Asking Autistics tag. That tag's for anyone uh, who wants to learn from autistic people. And then the other tag that's been around a bit longer is neurodiversity. Um, and that neurodiversity is a big umbrella. It includes people with ADHD, autism, dyspraxia, Tourette's, dyslexia, ADHD. It's, it's a big, big umbrella. You know, two and a half years ago, I was just Krista. I was a girl who was just always way too hard on herself. Now, I'm the neurodivergent rebel. I'm proudly and unapologetically autistic. I amplify autistic voices, and I hope to show the world that autistic is just another way of being. Do you have questions? Yes. Question. You really put a lot of thought into kind of coping mechanisms and thought on how to deal with the situation. I think that's great. Um, how do you kind of 
when other people are saying, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You kind of find yourself more in a position where they're not necessarily asking that because that's where you've kind of molded yourself. Or how do you submerge yourself in those areas that you're not going to be able to explain? If I'm having a meltdown and people are asking me why I'm doing this, it's probably going to freak me out. I'm going to be more upset, honestly. That's why I'm going to remove myself okay. from the situation because, you know, I really, like, if I'm having a meltdown, I need someone to kind of be there and be a supporter, but if someone's like, grow up, what are you doing? Why are you acting like this? You know, it's it's not helpful to me. And so that's why it's like, I need to go be somewhere alone or I can take care of myself, you know? And because it, it's, it's some, it is hard sometimes to communicate if, if you're in that place. It really is. Hmm? No, that's really good. That's a good one, yeah. You, other people like um, what you can do. That's a really good thing. Is if you, uh, yeah, I've seen these note cards. Has anyone seen the little communication cards? Those communication cards are great. So when you're able to communicate, then maybe you write those communication cards. And so if someone asks, you can hand them the card and say, "This is what's happening." Because I promise you, I'm not going to be able to say, "My brain is not able to process information right now, and I'm having a sensory overload." I'm not going to be able to tell you all of that. I'm going to be a crying, hysterical mess. And giving the right word. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, I know you mentioned how you were struggling, like in school in the beginning, when you were like, think you said second grade. How did your the rest of your school lifetime go? Were you still in mainstream classes or? Yeah. So I spent time in all three classrooms. I spent time in special ed in elementary school. I spent time in mainstream, in and out, elementary, middle, and high school, and I actually spent time in gifted classes in high school as well. And I was, you know, teachers would describe me as a student who just kind of did their best to get by. Um, I don't know, I was struggling. It wasn't ever easy. It really wasn't. Um, and I've always kind of struggled with authority a little bit. That rebel thing is kind of because my mother is always kind of calling me a rebel. I was never trying to be a rebel. It's just kind of, I'm not trying to be rebellious. But you know, people always call me, you rebel, you rebel. So I'm like, I'm just going to embrace it. Ooh, yeah. So it, it can be hard to tell a little kid, but the difference from the inside out would be, you know, the tantrum, I want my way. I'm throwing a tantrum to get my way. The overload is. I don't know if narcissistic people here, if anyone's had that panic attack, it can feel a little bit like a panic attack. You're not really in control. You're definitely not worried about controlling other people. Although people might think, oh, you're just trying to get attention. You know, probably not. Like if someone's having a tantrum, I would assume, you know, you walk away, you know, they're probably gonna stop. But if someone's having an overload, they're probably gonna keep overloading for a while until they calm themselves down and soothe themselves down. Because it's not about the other person where the tantrum is like, about you and the overload is completely has nothing to do with you. You're just there. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But how late is late to be able to be diagnosed? I wish I I couldn't have had the information early enough, but double edged sword, back when I you know would have been diagnosed in elementary school, I don't know if it would have changed, you know, who I am as a person, if people would have treated me differently. But I know we have an entire generation of lost autistic adults. You know, I'm 30, I was diagnosed, or I'm 32 now. I was diagnosed at 29. And that was really late for me. People who say they were diagnosed in their teens, a lot of them say that was late for them too. Um, a lot of women especially are late diagnosed. And like I said, we have a whole generation of women, you know, like my parents' age and my grandparents' age who would just never have been diagnosed. And they're not diagnosed. A lot of them aren't diagnosed. Although I know a few women who've been diagnosed in their 50s. I mean, can you imagine going that long, just feeling different, not knowing why? Because that's what it's like. You feel different. You don't know why. You're like, why can everyone else do this? Why is this easy for everyone else? Why can't I just get that right? You know? And so I really couldn't put those thoughts to bed, you know, until I had the diagnosis and I really understood what that meant for me and I accepted it. But it wasn't, it was a process. And it wasn't instant either. You know, it took a couple of years, I think, to really... Mm-hmm. And he has meltdowns, and we can't figure out the root. He could be just happy. 
more than likely you may not know what the reason is. So, like for example, you know, sometimes, you know, if I have a meltdown, someone will think, oh, that was a little silly thing that set you off. But it wasn't even the thing that set me off, it was the accumulation of all the things that have been happening for the past week. And that was just the final straw kind of a thing. So it might be that maybe it was something little, but maybe there was, you know, it was a hard week or it was a hard day and it's just kind of added up and it's like, I can't take it anymore. So maybe, it's hard to say, everyone's different, but generally. Is there any questions? Awesome, everyone, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it.